So we'll move on to lecture one. I call it the apostolic model of relationship to the law. I think first thing you have to think about is how do I relate to the law? How do I approach this whole process of counseling? Because you're operating in an arena where everybody around you is quote unquote a professional and everybody around you is operating under licensure from the state and the state because the, those very same people are the ones that put together the regulations for the state. The state thinks they completely own the enterprise of counseling. So we need to be very aware of how we relate to the law. And I thought to look at this, we'd look at four principles to guide the biblical counselor. And here's principle number one. Recognize the government. That is, render under, unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. Uh, <clears throat> the Lord has put the government in place. According to Romans, he's put it in place for the benefit of society. So we need to recognize the government, and we need to recognize the government's responsibility, and if you please, right, given it by God, to monitor what goes on in society, and that includes the counseling enterprise. Principle number two is to submit to the government. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, Romans 13, one through four. So we are responsible to live within the framework of government mandates. However, there are times when we need to resist the government. Peter and John answered and said unto them, whither it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. Acts chapter four and verse 19. Now there, isn't, there aren't that many times when this becomes necessary, but there are times when it does. And probably in the future, there will be more times than we really would like to find ourselves in that position of resisting the government. Principle number four is know how to appeal to the government or to the law, if you please. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, wrote the Apostle Paul in Acts 28 and verse 19. So to do this, we have to know the law and what the law says and requires. <clears throat> now, I'm going to run you quickly here uh, through part of Jeremiah, because I think Jeremiah helps us see how to deal with our society and in terms of God's mandates for us within that society. If you read Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, here are the highlights that stick out. <clears throat> um, Jeremiah is saying, do not, uh, God is saying, do not say, uh, stop us. Uh, God says, I send you. God supports us. He says, I deliver you. God specifies our message, all I have commanded speak. And that, for example, in, in our current cultural situation in some places, uh, to attempt to counsel, particularly if you're a licensed counselor, to attempt to counsel a homosexual to change, and we'll get you into trouble. <clears throat> but the Lord says, here's what I say about this particular issue. Now, the, what's important is how you say what you say to the, to the homosexual. And you can, again, if you understand the law, there are certain things you can say and, and you can um, <clears throat> understand where the person's coming from. You understand what the state is saying and you can bring to, to the person's attention what God says, but you have to leave it in the court of the individual to make his or her decisions. And then the Lord specifies what our message is. My words in your mouth. So we are, we need, like Jeremiah, to speak God's words to 
the society and culture around us. And God's mandate is threefold, according to Jeremiah 1 and verse 17. He tells us to prepare, to gird up your loins, and that's what you're doing in taking this course. You're girding up your loins to be able to uh, do what God has called you to do, to speak the words God has called you to do within a hostile environment on many occasions. And then God says, proceed. The term in Jeremiah is arise. But basically he's saying, get with it. Get up and get going. Get it done. And then he says, present. Speak to them all which I have commanded you. So that's how we are to address our culture. We <clears throat> can um, uh, paint that picture in some different tones, perhaps, when we come to some of the New Testament passages. We learn to do this with in graciousness, in love, in respect. But I think those things were also there for Jeremiah. They're just not planted in this particular passage, but they're there. And then he tells Jeremiah what to expect. I will strengthen you. So strength is certain in 118. The battle is certain in 119. Wounds are certain. Rejection is certain. Difficulties are certain. You can count on it. Uh, somewhere along the way, you may well get a subpoena for your record. You may well get a subpoena. Uh, even though you try to make sure that doesn't happen, it could happen. <clears throat> you can have somebody accuse you of something you didn't do. Another reason why, to be very careful how you do things, and that's part of what this course is about, is how to do things and uh, protect yourself in those circumstances. And the Lord tells Jeremiah, victory is certain in verse 19. And I think the Lord tells us, victory is certain. It's not a cliche, but there is a sense in which I've read the final chapter, so I know what the outcome is going to be. But I don't know what the outcome may be along the way. And that takes me what I call lecture two. By the way, these lectures will not necessarily uh, end at the end of one session and and next one started the next session. Obviously, that's not the case here. Um, I've taught this class in class settings uh, where we have a lot of discussion back and forth. So therefore, these, these lectures will not necessarily be nice and packaged uh, with lecture one in one session, lecture two in two sessions. So be prepared for that. Lecture two. The development of American law. How do we get to where we are in American law? Why is American law in many respects favorable, has been traditionally favorable to a Christian context and a Christian approach to ministry and why we have some of the privileges and rights we have within our nation? Well, <clears throat> American law develops out of two strands, one the Hebrew law and the other the Roman system of law. <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, this began to shift toward commercial law and the development under Jewish influence. So even in that development, the Jewish law was very much important to the development of law, and that goes back to the Old Testament and what J Moses laid out to the people in ancient Israel. And kind of you come to the Reformation, uh, which began with Wycliffe in 13-something, if my memory serves me correctly. And this Bible is for the government of the people, said Wycliffe, by the people and for the people. Now, it sounds a lot like um, Abraham Lincoln, and I'm not too sure Lincoln didn't get it from Wycliffe somewhere along the way. This develops then into what we call English common law. Usage and customs become law. This was largely built on Old Testament law again. British common law and Puritan law became the foundation of American law, therefore biblical in its base. Parallel to that, however, developing in the Middle Ages was what was called natural law theory 
which led to the sociological jurisprudence that we have experienced in the last 60, 70 years here in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this denied the existence of such changeless principles as we had in English common law and Puritan law going back through the beginning all the way to Moses. The new view stressed tolerance, adaptability, flexibility, pragmatic rather than principled decisions and adapting to man's need as perceived at the particular time where it is uh, taking place. <clears throat> so this is kind of where the idea of the Constitution being a li living document comes from. It develops out of this kind of thinking. Example of sociological jurisprudence. One is no-fault divorce. Now, who was on the Committee on Uniform Divorce sponsored by the Ford Foundation? And the answer is experts from social and behavioral sciences. And what did, the, what did these laws do? They removed the idea of a guilty party in a divorce, removed the idea of justice, and the only sense of due left is the right of divorce. So at any point, at any time, a person can exercise, quote unquote, the right to divorce. The covenantal con concept of marriage, which has been traditional in the American scene and the English scene going back as way back and goes all the way back to the New Testament days and all the way back to the days of Moses, a covenantal relationship. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter three, that covenantal relationship goes all the way back to the beginning of time and God's creative uh, work in the garden. However, <clears throat> we in our modern age have decided we're smarter than God. And so we have come up with uh, social jurisprudence that changes these things for us. And therefore, divorce became accelerated in number, and I will say accelerated in messiness. Uh, if you've done much counseling, you know how messy divorce can become. Another example of social, social jurisprudence is abortion. The law was established by the court rather than the legislative process to start with. The biblical precedence of the accountability for life uh, was overlooked. The biblical idea of headship of a husband is set aside. The biblical idea of responsibility for action, becoming pregnant, were overthrown in lieu of, again, the social jurisprudence. Lecture three, going forward, we will be considering information and practices to avoid conflict that will lead to a tort. A tort, what is the definition of a tort? A tort is defined as a wrong committed by one person against another. Tort cases are civil rather than criminal in nature, and they cover in any area in which a person is wrong, with the exception of breach of contract. Three elements of every tort and action. Now let me pause here for a second <clears throat> and drop back and say, look, you're reading a good textbook. You're going to read some good articles along the way. Uh, hopefully, you'll take it upon yourself to get the supplemental text and read it. And parallel with all this, you're going to be uh, doing that devotional study in the book of in, in the uh, 119th Psalm, which is going to reiterate the law of the Lord and by various terms and usages over and over again. So I want you to realize I'm going over the lecture material quickly. It is a way of showing you what I emphasize. It's a way of putting a biblical slant on the material that you are experiencing in your reading. However, you're going to find there's a great concordance between what I'm saying and even the secular and the integrationist um, understanding of the law, the law itself. The way 
the integrationist might view it from the standpoint of being quote unquote a professional and a Christian at the same time may be a little bit different, but you're going to find that in terms of the, the law and in terms of how to protect yourself from the law, how to manage yourself within the law is going to be a common theme that runs through all this material. And you ought to learn a lot of specifics that will help you be careful how you live around and within the law. So what are, what, what are the things that are the elements of a tort? Well, first is the existence of a legal duty to care. Now that's a term you will hear if you, if you when you read that case about the Nally case and the MacArthur's church, you're gonna come across that term, the duty of care. <clears throat> That is that is the the product of uh, regulations and standards within the counseling field, and it is regulations and standards within the Association of, uh, of Certified Biblical Counselors. For example, we have a best practices statement, and if you ever if you remember that organization and you're called to give an explanation for what you're doing, uh, that code is your legal duty to care. What is spelled out there, your commitments there to people and to the, to the way you do the work of biblical counseling, that becomes your legal duty to care. Now, that legal duty to care can be extrapolated beyond that based on other uh, laws. Sometimes I would say even based on common sense, but technically, you are responsible to the legal code of the of the of the profession in, within which you work. Secondly, is a breach of that duty. What did you do or not do that that particular code called for you to do or not do? That's the breach of duty. And then, thirdly, there is an inquiry to a person's physical or mental well-being, a reputation or rights or privileges as a direct result of the breach of duty to care. I said inquiry, that should be injury. An injury to a person's physical or mental well-being, reputation or rights and privileges as a direct result of the breach of duty to care. So those three things are, when you hear that word tort, Remember, it's a civil matter, a civil suit, and these are the three things involved. Now, the existence of the legal duty and the breach, breach of duty can also, um, can also be involved in a criminal case, obviously. There are occasions where criminal, where criminal uh, charges have been filed with a counselor and the counselor has been exonerated on criminal basis, and the plaintiff has come back and sued on the basis of a tort, and it's a whole different case. So keep that in mind. If you remember the famous case of um, O.J., O.J., um, he was exonerated, found not guilty in the criminal, and then he was sued on the civil and the civil one. And so he was therefore uh, culpable for a significant um, injury payment. The good news is I read the last chapter and we win. I mentioned that before with tongue in cheek saying it's very common. I'm gonna use it here again, just to make a point. We know Ultimately, righteousness will win. Ultimately, if we're on the side of righteousness, we will win. But along the way, that's not always the case. Now, there may be some real tough way, things along the way. And that's the bad news. There will be some tough battles ahead, both in and out of the courtroom. <clears throat> um, an important nuance. 
if you, when you read about the MacArthur case, um, you'll read a lot of extra things about the case in which John MacArthur made certain statements and teachings and so forth. And MacArthur's blanket condemnation of psychology and psychotherapy as a theoretical construct actually has validity. However, <clears throat> he fails to reckon with the status of these as legal and social forces, that is, professions, which have been granted certain jurisdictions. So philosophically, theologically, we may conclude that psychology and psychotherapy are invalid. To what extent, how much, uh, I'll let each of you determine your own thinking on that for right now. That's not the point of this discussion. Uh, <clears throat> but whatever it is, we must reckon with the fact that they are recognized by law as professions who have jurisdiction over a certain area of service and function in our society. Therefore, we must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as a dove, and conduct our biblical counseling, quote unquote, profession. I don't like even calling it that, but we'll call it that in quotation marks for right now in a manner in which we deal with the legal status of psychology and psychotherapy without compromising our position. So we can be critical of it, uh, but we also have to recognize it has <clears throat> status in our society and the position that we take, the sufficiency of scripture, and the Bible as our final authority, those are our positions, but they are not sanctioned positions by a profession that is recognized by the state. We are religious, and it is only valid within the framework of religious freedom. And that particular freedom keeps getting narrowed uh, more and more. There are those today who want to say the only place you have the freedom to exercise religion is inside the four walls of your church. When you walk out in the public square, you are not to go there. You to be you're to be a secularist. <clears throat> well, if you're in this program and you are following in, as a biblical counselor or at least as a a Christian who is living a vibrant Christian life, then you recognize that that is not the case and that we are immediately in conflict with that because the whole avenue, the whole uh, playing field of life, if you want to put it that way, we are responsible to bring our Christianity into the midst of it. We are responsible to live by Christian principle in all arenas. So what are the reasons for litigation? Why do counselors find themselves sometimes in litigation? Well, I would say the first thing to remember is we are in spiritual warfare. That is a reality. <clears throat> um, I preached through the book of Matthew, filling in for a church for about 13 months as an interim, and in the process, uh, I couched the whole exposition of the book as spiritual warfare, as spiritual warfare and living on a battlefield. And <clears throat> if you walk through that book, you begin to realize more and more, here we see Jesus conducting a spiritual war. We see him on the offensive in the midst of a spiritual war. And it is, he was attacked over and over and over again. We can expect to be attacked over and over again. And if people can use the law to get at us, they will. We are living in the litigious times. 
Oh, I hear the ads sometimes. Here in Alabama, we got an Al, a, a lawyer named Alexander Shinar, and he has billboards from the time you crossed the line coming out of uh, South Carolina into, into Alabama, and you have all the way down the interstate until you get to the coast. You have his billboards. Um, come and let me serve you Alabama. And I just saw one night the other night. He said, uh, we do business in all 67 counties of Alabama. Come and let me be your representative. So people are encouraged to sue. So calling it a litigious society is pretty accurate. <clears throat> so we need to live and practice in a, in a atmosphere of prayer. Uh, we need to use the legal legal incorporation and all that that entails. That's a liberty that is put at our disposal, a right that is at our disposal, and we should use it. And we should be competent in handling the Bible. Um, that that will keep us from making claims we shouldn't claim. It will be. It will keep us from making the Bible say things it doesn't say, and it will enable us to say things to people that will help them, and not uh, lead them astray. Um, it is good to have a good attorney. Now, most of us can't afford to have a an attorney on uh, retainer. When I worked for a big church, we did have a return an attorney on retainer. Uh, and as a result, I have a good relationship with him. So if I called him today and asked him uh, a technical question about the law, uh, he would be glad to help me with that. Um, so that leads me to say this. If you're going to be conducting a counseling ministry, then cultivate friendship with an attorney uh, where <clears throat> your friendship is your retainer. Now, you don't abuse that. But if necessary to something critical, you can call him and say, what do I do about this? And he'll either tell you or he'll say, look, you need more than I can give you as a friend here. You need, you need to hire an attorney to handle this. That may be the case. And then there are three common reasons for litigation. Three common reasons for litigation. One, confidentiality. Two, conduct of advice. Three, sexual misconduct. Those are the three arenas in which counselors are may be <clears throat> very, <clears throat> very, excuse me, <clears throat> counselors may be very open to litigation. And we'll talk more about confidentiality as we go along. We'll talk more about the content advice we go along. And we'll talk more about the sexual misconduct. Right here, <clears throat> we're just making the point. These are the three most common reasons for litigation. It's important to differentiate privilege status and confidentiality. Privilege status. This protects the information that you have that somebody else gave you in a legal proceeding. If you're a clergyman, you have the right of privilege. It means he or she does not have to give up the information in a court proceeding. Now, there are some exceptions to that, and there are some attorneys that will hammer you with all kinds of threats. So you need an attorney who can tell you in this state, in this circumstance, um, am I wise to stand up or do I give out the confidential data? Confidentiality is an obligation to the client to protect information he is uh, against every other source outside of the legal area. So, any place outside of the legal arena, you make a, a you you are assumed to be confidential with the information the client has given you. Now later on we're going to talk about how you make some exceptions to that, 
and how the client agrees to those exceptions or how the counselee agrees to those exceptions. But for right now, simply for definition purposes, <clears throat> confidentiality means I have an ob obligation to protect client information, counselee information, if you don't like the word client, against every other source outside the legal arena. The reason I use the word client here, this is true, whether it's counseling or whether it's any other, anything else. <clears throat> Counselor self-protection. Discuss the limits of confidentiality at the first session. Now, if you want to look at this uh, in more detail, see an example of, an, of a counseling agreement in my book, Curing the Heart. That book's written by myself and Bill Hines. And you'll find there at the back all kinds of uh, helpful forms and data gathering information. If you haven't read, I would. So, uh, obviously encourage it. And then secondly, know your state law. Know your state law. Know your state law regarding child or elder abuse. Know your state law regarding suicide or threatening behavior. And on this particular issue, keep specific and accurate documentation of what you do. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we'll talk about that again later. And then there's protective privilege ends where the public peril begins. And that is a quote from the California uh, Supreme Court. Protective privilege ends where the public peril begins. Now, obviously that's a really catchy statement and a good statement, but it certainly is open to all kinds of interpretation. What is protective? What is, uh, what is public peril? What does that amount to? Is that a threat of um, a terror bombing? Or is that simply somebody <clears throat> um, spreading a lie? So you have to interpret that particular quote from the Supreme Court. And lawyers, I think sometimes lawyers' main uh, task in court is to establish the definition that they want for particular terms and then get everybody else to agree with their definition. Practical directives. Here are some very practical things you do <clears throat> to help you protect yourself. Keep files locked. If you have a secretary or administrative assistant, she has, <clears throat> she has the same responsibility as the counselor does. If she has privy to the information by simply by virtue of her work, she has the same responsibility. It's like the administrative assistant to the general uh, has to have a uh, security clearance, just like the general does. So it is with administrative assistant in terms of responsibility. If case notes are typed, either erase the disk or carefully pass code it so nobody else can get to it. Assign case numbers. Uh, uh, case number codes. Uh, some places that I have been in the past and worked in the past, we have had the only place where the name occurred was in the, ma in the master file that the administrative assistant had who set up the cases. Everything else was done by uh, code and then in, and on notes it, with first names only. <clears throat> so you have to decide in your given situation what you want to do there. I mention it this way just to keep, just to alert you to those possibilities. Know the state law about minors. What age is a minor? Who may see a minor? How may you see a minor? And some of the laws there are as applicable in a parallel way to a biblical counselor as they are to a secular counselor. So again, know your law in your state. Know the, the law, state law regarding, regarding HIV. That isn't as much of a problem today as it used to be, but it still can be a problem. It's a, it still can be a problem of confidentiality. So know the law in your state, what it requires. And the content of advice. Professionals who have specialties, training, and expertise who fail to adhere to a higher standard than the average citizen are liable in a tort for professional malpractice. And again, this is the value of a code of ethics. It defines for you 
and it defines for the court just what your standard of practice is. And I gave you the reference here for ACBC, where you can go look at what that standard, what those standards are for that organization. Know your association code. An increasing number of legal scholars agree that a duty of care will be imposed upon spiritual counselors, especially clergy, in the future. The test course of action for a Christian is to realize that the constitutional protection is not absolute and that all, although the courts may not hold, yet hold spiritual counselors to the fine duty of care toward the parishioner or client as the secularist is, it is best to act as if that is true. So know your, know your code and then act accordingly.